Well, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, first of all, uh, uh, to, to Yeni for organizing and orchestrating this meeting. Uh, so um, we are interested in uh, how neural interactions give rise to cognitive phenomena. And uh, uh, today's talk is uh, uh, a bit of a corticocentric view of, uh, of this question. And uh, the, uh, uh, one of the major hypotheses that's been brought up during this meeting that connectivity gives rise to uh, behavioral functions. And uh, uh, we know quite a bit of, uh, uh, about the individual neurons, uh, their biophysical properties uh, and, and uh, other properties. And uh, we know uh, quite a bit uh, about the uh, uh, gross anatomy uh, of the brain, the different uh, connectivity patterns. Uh, and again, uh, a lot of uh, the experts in the field um, are here. But uh, we don't know much about the uh, structure of this local connectivity maps uh, on the microcircuitry level. And uh, 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 since most of the study is focused on, on studying this, this microcircuitry uh, level connectivity, we're done uh, uh, either with electron microscopes or in vitro in, in brain slices. As a consequence, it was also very hard to uh, relate the uh, microstructure connectivity level to the computational functions of individual neurons. Uh, in uh, those uh, uh, few species, uh, C. elegans and the uh, drosophila, for which we know the full connectome uh, at the synaptic level, uh, uh, we again have this gap that we don't know uh, oftentimes what the individual neurons are doing. Uh, uh, functionally, and I would argue that also if we would uh, uh, have the, uh, the structural connectum for more, uh, uh, for, for, for higher organisms, uh, it would still be very hard to infer the function from the structure alone. And in fact, uh, a recent work from uh, Andrew Leifer's group uh, in C. elegans uh, showed that uh, the, uh, the, the connectome itself does not predict too well the functional interactions. So, uh, uh, and, and there are several reasons for that. And the, uh, although the structural connectivity is essentially the scaffold on, which, on top of which the neural interactions unfold, the uh, different connectivity can be uh, modulated in vivo by uh, neuromodulators, the, and more generally the rest, uh, the state of the rest of the network, uh, and this is what gives the flexibility to the neural circuit. So what we, uh, uh, we wanted to, to do uh, when I was a postdoc uh, with Carl Svoboda is essentially uh, have a way to measure the, uh, the functional interactions with uh, uh, also in a causal way uh, to infer the connectivity during uh, in the living brain on the level of individual neurons. And thanks to uh, advancements in uh, two photon microscopy and optogenetics, uh, we were building upon uh, uh, this, um, uh, uh, these developments to uh, and develop a tool to rapidly map uh, causal interactions or effective connectivity between individual cells. So the idea is, uh, is uh, pretty simple. We stimulate optogenetically uh, a neuron in vivo, and we look using calcium imaging at the responses of the rest of the neurons uh, that we can see uh, uh, around the stimulated neuron. And uh, by doing that uh, uh, volumetrically across different uh, planes in uh, layer two, three of the cortex, uh, and uh, randomizing the stimulation patterns, we can map very fast uh, interactions or uh, effective connectivity maps between uh, uh, about a half a million of pairs of neurons uh, in vivo in just uh, uh, 30 minutes, uh, which gives us uh, the opportunity to then study the very same neurons also functionally in terms of their coding properties, etc. cetera. So, uh, so overall, uh, we can routinely collect nowadays uh, data sets comprising of uh, 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 millions of neural pairs, uh, uh, co connectivity-wise, in terms of their causal interactions. And uh, uh, the, uh, most of the work uh, that 
um, focused on relating function as connectivity to function uh, and the level of individual neurons focused on sensory cortices. And uh, we know quite little about higher order areas such as the motor cortex. And the problem with studying the motor cortex that, uh, or other higher order areas that require active behavior is that you also need a task to, uh, uh, to, to um, infer the, the functional properties. And uh, as Pablo Blinder uh, uh, mentioned yesterday, m lots of tasks, uh, uh, especially in rodents, require many, many uh, uh, trials in order to train the animal in sufficiently interesting task. And uh, we heard previously from Randor Shun on some of the tasks that we used in the past that, uh, um, for example, required the animal to use short-term memory in a perceptual decision-making task, et cetera, that require uh, many weeks of training. So instead we wanted, which of course would alter the brain connectivity, so uh, we wanted to have a simple task in which the uh, animal would do sufficiently interesting uh, behaviors without training. And um, uh, uh, um, we, we came up with a very intuitive task in which the animal simply needs to grab with its tongue to reach for a water reward that is, can be positioned in uh, different places around uh, the mouse face. And the mice do it very intuitively. They don't need any pre-training uh, to do this task. We, they do it from the very first day of behavior. And using this uh, task, we can now look at uh, the activity of uh, individual neurons in the, in the motor cortex. And for example, for this neuron, we see that uh, the activity of this neuron is modulated by the position of the target. And um, we can systematically construct maps, response maps for uh, every neuron. So this particular neuron likes to uh, respond when the target is in the upper part uh, 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 around the mouse face. And uh, uh, we can uh, um, turn these uh, responses into a heat map of the positional tuning of the, of the neuron. We see essentially reward position neurons uh, with specific tuning. This is an example, one neuron, and we see here a matrix of 100 neurons with different positional tunings. And these maps actually remind uh, to, 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 to some extent, uh, play cells. If you record simultaneously many play cells, they would also have this uh, different place field. So we argue that we uh, uncover here essentially a, a cognitive map for near space in the motor cortex of a naive uh, mouse. And now we can combine it with the connectivity mapping and uh, uh, ask how these neurons actually uh, connect with each other or interact with each other. What we see is that uh, uh, neurons uh, um, with this positional tuning actually have a like-to-like -like connectivity uh, uh, between each other. So, so neurons with similar positional tuning excite each other and inhibit neurons uh, with opposite positional tuning. And this uh, uh, connectivity motifs may uh, uh, be used for processes of action selection when the animal actually needs to select one single target for, uh, for its action. Um, and uh, uh, if we look more closely at the, uh, the connectivity patterns with respect to, now not to, uh, uh, to the function of the neurons, but to anatomical space, we see that uh, if we look at connectivity as a function of lateral horizontal distance, we see that the connectivity decays uh, uh, rather rapidly. Uh, and um, uh, however, it is, uh, appears to be elongated uh, along the axial dimension, so basically uh, in, in the Z, uh, they mention, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, this, um, uh, this excitation in the Z dimension uh, basically reflects uh, um, uh, functional mini columns of excitation followed by uh, uh, inhibition further away laterally. So essentially we see uh, a Mexican hat of uh, excitation and inhibition over anatomical space. And uh, the, uh, uh, this connectivity motif of like-to-like -like connectivity with respect to position is actually embedded within this uh, 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 Mexican hat of excitation and inhibition uh, over the cortical surface. Now, this uh, maps of connectivity that we see are pretty complex. And um, we can ask, are, this, uh, uh, are they random or not? And uh, we see, in fact, that uh, these connectivity maps are highly non-random, and uh, um, 
while most of the neurons don't have many outgoing connections, there are some neurons in the tail of this distribution that have an uh, uh, surprisingly large number of outgoing connections. We refer to them as hubs. And uh, these hubs neurons actually turn out to be less positionally uh, uh, tuned. So neurons with fewer connections are, are, have a sharp tuning. Neurons with uh, more outgoing connections have a weak tuning. These hub neurons, uh, 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 however, are more sensitive to the movement timing, and uh, they have a higher uh, correlation with the other neighboring neurons. So we think that these neur uh, hub neurons uh, might be some kind of general orchestrators of the uh, behavior, whereas the uh, less specific neurons might be the one who pick the exact target. So in summary, we have a new method for effective connectivity mapping, uh, we have a new behavior in naive mice uh, that expose a, what we think of a cognitive map for a reward position. We uh, see that this reward position tuning have a like-to-like -like connectivity between them uh, that follows uh, uh, a Mexican hat of excitation and inhibition of our anatomical space. And we see that uh, 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 different neurons uh, uh, that have a different network topology uh, have um, and topological function have um, different functional roles. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, my new lab here uh, and, uh, and my uh, uh, collaborators, um, and I'll be happy to take uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arseny. I see a question, right? It wasn't clear to me. So you have the the map when there is during the behavior and later on when you do the measurement of these correlations so this is during behavior or this is the spontaneous it's so clear to me yeah so we are doing the uh, uh connectivity mapping effective connectivity mapping just before the behavior uh half an hour earlier so we compare the map during uh the uh during rest to the function of the neurons during behavior but we can also do that during the actual behavior. Uh, so, so we match the tuning exposed by the behavior to the effective connectivity map uh, measured during rest, yeah. But uh, the uh, maps uh, of uh, uh, functional connectivity measured by noise correlation inferred during the behavioral state or during rest are actually both equally well predicted by the effective connectivity uh, uh, done during rest. So we think that generalizes at least across this stage that we probe uh, uh, when the mouse is under the microscope. Arseny over here. Yeah. So, lovely talk, thank you. Uh, I have a somewhat tangential question based on Dan Huber's previous findings. Do you know how the mice localize the lick port? Uh, how the mice, what? How they find the lick port. Uh, so in this task, we wanted to make it uh, as simple uh, uh, as possible. So basically, the, the port appears uh, in front of the mouse face. They can lick it, uh, they can uh, smell it, they can uh, whisk it, they can potentially even see it. Uh, and uh, uh, really, the, uh, the motivation was, uh, here is the source of reward, just grab it. Now we are uh, uh, making some uh, more, uh, or planning to make some more complicated version of this where uh, we would uh, uh, basically, the mice would require to use shorter memory to find uh, the target. Yeah, but here we try to make it as simple as possible for them to make it more natural. All right, thank you very much. We need to move on. And thank you. Uh, thank you.